The age-old question, does money buy happiness? I often hear the 2010 study by Kahneman and Deaton cited as the decisive study concluding that making anything more than $75,000 a year won't make you any happier. But is that true? In this video, we'll go over the new research and explain what the literature really has to say about wealth and well-being. What's going on guys? Dr. Jabal, MedSchoolInsiders.com. For those of you who are new here, I graduated with my MD in 2017 and matched into plastic surgery, which I ultimately quit. You can learn the story on my vlog channel. After publishing and presenting dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed papers and abstracts, you can find the full list on my personal website, I've developed an astute sense of research methodology, analysis, limitations, and even the research culture. I constantly hear studies being misquoted or misattributed, and so I've decided to start a series of videos that debunk common misunderstandings and misconceptions of the scientific literature. We'll be starting with money and happiness. First, let's talk about the most commonly quoted study when it comes to money and happiness, Kahneman and Deaton's study from 2010 titled, High Income Improves Evaluation of Life But Not Emotional Well-Being. Funny enough, the title says nothing about happiness. In fact, it even states that money does not improve emotional well-being, but everyone seems to think it does. The author defines two types of well-being, emotional well-being and life evaluation. Emotional well-being is the quality of a person's everyday experiences, such as joy, fascination, anxiety, sadness, anger, and affection. Life evaluation refers to a person's thoughts about his or her own life on a longer timescale. The main conclusion of the study was that people's life evaluation rose steadily with income. The authors interpreted the findings that more money did not buy happiness, but rather less money is associated with emotional pain. Based on their results, perhaps $75,000 per year is the threshold beyond which further increases in income no longer improve the ability to do what matters most to your emotional well-being, such as spending time with people you like, avoiding pain and disease, and enjoying leisure. Right off the bat, there are limitations in that the study doesn't account for drastically variable cost of living by region or city, and as this study was done close to a decade ago, we need to factor in inflation for our current understanding. Beyond that, the highest income bracket was simply defined as greater than $125,000 per year, net worth was not included, and the sample had a very small number of participants making in the six-figure range. Lastly, and most importantly, this study and the ones that do follow are all cross-sectional studies. Without going into the types of study designs, understand that cross-sectional studies can never demonstrate causation, only correlation. And in science, the findings from a cross-sectional study are not nearly as strong as a well-designed prospective study. Okay, so what does the scientific literature say now? Donnelly and colleagues published a paper titled, The Amount and Source of Millionaire's Wealth Moderately Predict Their Happiness. This Harvard Business School study surveyed over 4,000 millionaires on various factors, from their net worth, to income, marital status, employment status, country of residence, gender, age, etc. And unlike Kahneman's study, they looked at factors beyond income, including net worth. Their conclusion? Two factors were most significantly correlated with improved levels of happiness. First, a net worth of $10 million or greater, and two, earning your wealth rather than inheriting it. Oh, wait a minute. Now I need to have a net worth of $10 million to be happiest? Not quite. Again, taking any single study as gospel is dangerous. And again, this is correlation, not causation. Other studies, such as Boyce and colleagues from 2010, suggest that an individual's relative ranking of their income compared to others is more important than their absolute wealth. Okay, so how much money do I need to be happy? If I were to blindly go off of the conclusion of these studies, I would tell you to make $75,000 per year and have a net worth of 10 million or more, which you had to have earned rather than inherited. Again, Make 75k a year and have 10 mil in the bank that you earned. Starting to see why this doesn't make sense? No single study should be treated as the singular truth. Every single study has limitations, even the well-designed ones. 
Aknan et al. in 2009 demonstrated that people place too much emphasis on accumulating wealth. We think more money makes us happier than it actually does. We spend more time at work, grinding, putting off times with friends and loved ones because we believe moving up the ladder and making more money will make us happier in the end. So perhaps there's something else we aren't considering. Could how we spend our money be more important than the actual dollar amount? Gilovich and colleagues, as well as Van Boven et al, demonstrated that spending on experiences and spending on others was associated with greater happiness than spending on material goods. Dunn and colleagues demonstrated that giving to charity was also more happiness inducing than spending on material goods. At this point, I'd like to invite you to take a step back. There are no easy answers in life. Sure, Giving to charity and spending on experiences will make you happier than buying goods, according to a study. But if you're struggling to make ends meet and put food on the table, will you maximize your happiness by spending money on healthy groceries or on a vacation to South Africa? Blanket statements summarizing any study are misguided and ignorant. Out of the people who tout the statistic that you don't need more than $75,000 per year to maximize your happiness, how many do you think actually read the study? How many have a research background or can at least critically analyze the merits and limitations of a study? The ability to think for yourself and filter incoming information is one of the most underrated skills in our current time. We want to be spoon-fed all the answers. Doctors should always know what's wrong, and Google should always answer all of my questions. The reality is, as humans, there's still so much that we don't understand and there are still gaping holes in the scientific literature. Instead of focusing on a certain number to justify your behavior or lack of behavior, create a life on your own terms. Mindfully and deliberately ask yourself, what will make me happy? What kind of life do I want to live? If I thought money was the answer to happiness, I wouldn't have left one of the most competitive and lucrative fields in medicine, especially after spending all those years in college med school, and grinding my way into a plastic surgery residency. But by appreciating the scientific literature for what it is and for what it isn't, I determined it's more important to me to make a lasting impact on the world and on medical education. I want my legacy to be ending medical student and resident suicide. If I make plastic surgeon money in the process, awesome. And if not, I'll still be happier in the end. Thanks for watching. If you found the content helpful, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can also get exclusive behind the scenes access. See you guys in that next one.